Hi folks, I'm Dr. Matt and today's video is going to be on the anti-inflammatory effects of glucocorticoid drugs. So what we're going to go through, firstly we'll go through a brief process of how inflammation first manifests. Then we will look at what are the most common clinical indications or diseases that have an inflammatory basis of why you, want to, why you want to use these drugs. And then finally, we'll look at the mechanism of action of glucocorticoids and then how it leads to their effect. All right, so let's start with the process of inflammation. This is very quickly compressed, so it's not gonna be exhaustive, but hopefully you'll get the main points. All right, so the first thing we need to have is inflammatory inducers. These are causal or, or atological um, underpinnings that will lead to inflammation kicking off. So I've kind of combined it down to three main categories of causes. So we have microbes. These would be microorganisms, usually pathogens that will come into the body. These could be viruses, bacteria, fungi, for, for instance. And these will have particular flags on them. And these flags will be picked up by our immune cells. So there's something on these that are foreign. Now, the most common example of that foreign flag, let's say, that these microbes would have is what we call PAMP. P-A-M-P, so pathogen associated molecular pattern. So it's kind of like, just think of it like a uniform or a flag that these microbes will have, which will induce inflammation or start the process off. Next, we have foreign antigens. So an antigen is usually a protein that gives a cell um, an identification and it can be both your own antigens or something foreign. So in this case, it's foreign, but it's important to note that some of these can be your own, but they're picked up to be seen as foreign. So just bear with me for one second. So foreign antigens, it could come from the outside world. So it could, it could be a piece of pollen. It could be a splinter that has broken off from a bit of wood. That would be foreign. But you could also have your own antigens that is seen to be foreign. And this is going to be the basis of hypersensitive disorders or autoimmune diseases. So this is where your immune system sees something in your bottom as something in your body as foreign, okay, when it shouldn't be. And that would then start inflammation off, okay? So it's just important to note that foreign antigens, even though I put it as foreign, it could actually be your own cells that's seen as foreign, okay? And then finally, tissue necrosis. So what that means, are cells are dying for some reason. So some of the reasons for cells to die would be physical injury, running out of oxygen, so hypoxia, um, too much heat, too cold, chemical injury. This could cause cell death. Now, once cells die, particularly if it's necrosis, it's not planned, what will happen is the cell will kind of explode. It just pushes everything on the outside, which then means certain things that are normally found in the cell will start to go out of the cell. So lots of potassium, because remember, potassium is found inside the cell. Now it leaks out everywhere. Or lots of ATP or lots of DNA. Once that spills out, it's an inducer. It's telling the body, oh, we've got cell damage here, there's a problem. So these are inducers, they start the process off. Then we have receivers. These are immune cells that are located in the body where you're most likely to get cell damage or invasion. So the common cells are macrophages, dendritic cells, mast cells, neutrophils. They're immune cells and they're waiting to, to get these inducers to come to them. Now, once these two come together, then we need to bring in more recruits to help with the problem. Because if we have tissue injury or we get invasion, we wanna bring recruits in to get rid of this. So these guys will then have to call recruits from throughout the body. So we need to somehow get a message out. So what's the message gonna be? It's gonna be a mediator. So step three are the cell mediators. These cells release chemical signals, mediators. The most common examples are cytokines and autocoids. Autocoids is just a category meaning um, locally produced hormones almost. So they uh, are produced, turned on to signal to something. And some examples would be histamines or eucocoids. Eucocoids would be prostaglandins, leukotrins. I'll go through quickly in a second on how these were produced. But it's important just to note that these mediators will essentially bring in help to to overcome the problem that started it all, to try and heal, remove the problem. So with respect to prostaglandins and leukotrins, how are they made? Well, they're made in this pathway, okay? So imagine the cell being one of these has been induced by these, activating these, and now you need to make these, 
Okay, so the starting point is the phospholipid. This is the cell membrane on one of these cells, probably mostly macrophages, mast cells, neutrophils. Then once they're turned on through the inducers, they will, through an enzyme, a protein called phospholipase, will start to modify bits of the cell membrane into arachidonic acid. Then other enzymes such as cyclooxygenase, sometimes called COX-1, COX-2, and lipooxygenase will then make different things, different mediators. Now the two important ones that I want you to know are prostaglandins and leukotrins. These will then cause an effect like other cytokines will do. What's the effect? Well, it's going to be these things. Okay. Now remember before I go through this, what's the point of inflammation? Well, it's to get rid of this stuff because you don't want to get invaded. So it's trying to bring in recruits, white blood cells to get rid of the microbes. Or if there's a lot of tissue injury or damage or death, you want to clean it up. So you want to bring things in to get rid of the black bacteria or viruses or clean up the mess. Okay, we need to do that. And then we need to heal the tissue. So we need to then bring in certain cells that will lay down new tissue so it repairs and then it goes back to normal. Okay, so all these steps will help to do this. So these are the steps of inflammation. Vascular changes. So this is blood vessel. Blood vessels will dilate, they get bigger. They will become more leaky. So the effects on the vascular, the signs of vascular effects would be redness, heat, swelling. Then we have the cellular effects. We bring in white blood cells to the area to help do the cleanup. So we bring in monocytes to macrophages. We bring in neutrophils. We bring in lymphocytes. We bring in eosinophils. That's hopefully going to clear up the mess and deal with the problem. Then we do the healing. So we bring in certain cells that can um, lay down new tissue and help heal. For instance, fibroblasts. And then lastly, we have some nervous effects from this process. So we get pain stop you moving to tell you there's a problem. And maybe once it starts to heal, we get a bit itchy. Okay, so these are the effects. This is normal when you have a problem. But what happens when this just continues and continues and continues? So we get chronic problems. It doesn't heal. It just stays on and on and on. Or it just keeps coming back, coming back and coming back. And so this is the indications now where we would need steroid-based anti-inflammatories. So what are the most common examples? So these I've drawn down the bottom are three common examples of why a person would use a steroid, specifically a glucocorticoid, for an inflammatory based condition. We have problems with the skin. What are some inflammatory based, chronic inflammation based skin problems? Well, we would have eczema. So that could be either a topic eczema, which is an allergy based eczema, or a contact based allergy. So you, you react to a certain substance like, like latex. Okay, or it's a severe allergic reaction which then manifests on the skin or the mucous membranes like your lips, or your eyes. This is the problem here. Bronchioles, most notably asthma, and then joints, most notably rheumatoid arthritis. These are the three most common reasons for why a person would use a glucocorticoid for an inflammatory based condition. So starting with the skin, all right, here is an example of how it would happen. So in the skin, in the dermis, we have mast cells and dendritic cells. So the mast cell, there's a dendritic cell, which are these guys here. Something comes in, let's say a foreign antigen, we call it a pollen, okay? Pollen comes in. This person, let's say, is already predisposed to be a bit more sensitive to certain things, so they're more likely to have allergies. So the pollen, the pollen comes in, goes through the skin, goes to the dendritic cell. The dendritic cell engulfs the pollen, mushes it up, and then presents it to the surface, where another cell, a T helper cell, comes along, sees that there's something foreign here, recruits a B cell, the B cell will produce antibodies, specifically IgE. The IgE then will get made against pollen and then it will start to stick on the surface of the, macro, of the mast cell, should I say. So the mast cell being here. So that, now, that mast cell is now what we call sensitized. So if this person gets pollen again, then we're going to react. So down the track, let's say a year later in spring, pollen comes back, goes in the skin and the mast cell locks onto the pollen. What is the mast cell? The mast cell is a bundle of granules. The granules are histamines. So they release the histamines, histamines goes out, blood vessels will react to the histamines, will dilate, become leaky. So what happens to the skin? It becomes red, it becomes swollen, it becomes itchy, it becomes maybe pustule, and then it's, a, it's annoying to the person. Now, if this continues for days and then weeks, it may start to dry out, 
and then become flaky and really itchy. And this is the um, eczema part. So therefore, you would want to rectify this with an anti-inflammatory, and we're going to get to that in a second. So that's the, the skin basis of inflammation and particularly chronic inflammation that would warrant treatment, okay? Moving to the bronchioles, this is asthma. In this case, we're focusing on the bronchioles, which is the airway with smooth muscle. In this case, we're probably gonna have macrophages, mast cells, and eosinophils. These guys are going to be releasing particularly leukotrins, and leukotrins are gonna cause a lot of increased vascular permeability, bronchoconstriction, as well as increased mucus production. So if that happens in the bronchioles, so what would cause that? Again, you have an individual who is predisposed to being allergic. Sometimes these guys work together. So sometimes people who have eczema and hay fever are more likely to have asthma. And this type of asthma is an allergy-based asthma. So certain triggers, maybe like pollen, maybe like exercise, cold air, will trigger it, but they have an overreactive inflammatory response. So their airways become, just like we saw here, they become uh, full of edema. So the airways swell, they make more mucus and they start to constrict, the, the smooth muscles start to constrict, which ultimately means it's harder to get air out. So this is the problem with asthma, they can't get the air out. So they find it difficult breathing. So again, this individual needs some kind of anti-inflammatory to remove that, inflammatory, that, remove that inflammatory cause. Finally, we'll go to rheumatoid arthritis. Rheumatoid arthritis has a combination of a genetic underpinning or predisposition, as well as certain environmental factors, let's say like smoking, for instance. Now, the foreign antigen that's seen as, this is this part here, as not being new, is one example is collagen. Okay, so collagen, particularly type 2, is the, the, the issue here. So what happens is your immune system picks up collagen, sees it as collagen 2, sees it as foreign. We, we have the kind of same sensitization response here. And what happens is, because you're going to have collagen 2 in here, we have um, T helper cells coming in here, and they're going to recruit macrophages. Macrophages come along, and they will start to release cytokines. The cytokines will then recruit fibroblasts. Okay, so these are the healing cells. Fibroblasts will come along and fibroblasts will get told to become active because this is a chronic effect. So they'll start to lay down lots of tissue on the synovial membrane. Okay, so this is what we call fibrosis, but specifically in this case, this is a panis forming. Okay, now this is just going to make the inflammation worse, so it's going to just keep ramping up. The macrophages will release certain... Um, Cytokines such as tumor necrosis whoops, factor alpha, interleukin 1, interleukin 6, and these guys will start to recruit uh, other cells, start to create proteases that will start to erode the cartilage, which is the protective ends of the bone. It will activate osteoclasts, which will start to degrade the bone, and so and then bring in more blood, blood cells, so we get kind of an angiogenesis. So the joint will start to become dysfunctional. It will start to be misaligned, deformed. It's painful, it's red. It's gonna be very hard to move. And this is now in multiple joints in the body. So this is a arthritis, but it is in many locations, hands, back, etc. So these are common inflammatory based conditions that are chronic and very debilitating. So this is where you may want to bring in the use of glucocorticoids. So how do they work? This is the last point of today. What's their mechanism of action to help these responses? Okay, so glucocorticoid um, can be made normally in the adrenal gland, in the cortex of the adrenal gland. They are made, as an example, is cortisone. So cortis cortisone is released in cases of stress to help upregulate the production of glucose to help you fight and flight, but also to maybe downregulate the immune system, downregulate inflammation when you are trying to stay alive. So we can use precursors or we can use similar agents to cortisone, such as hydrocortisone, okay, that's commonly used on the skin. We can use prednisone, which is 10 times more powerful than cortisone, or we can use dex dexamethasone. That's about 25 times more stronger or potent than cortisone. 
How does it work? Well, glucocorticoids are made from cholesterol, so they have a fat basis. That means they don't dissolve in plasma. That means they need to be carried when you give them. So you could give the drugs topically, you could give it orally, or you can inject it parentally. But when it's in the blood, it needs to be carried. So the glucocorticoids, which I've drawn in red here, needs to be carried on a carrier protein. So this is the, this black thing here, glucocorticoid, glucocorticoid binding protein. When it comes to the cell where you want it to work, notably to work with the cytokines, because that's what you want to downregulate is these cytokines. We really work on these cells, the immune cells. So when the glucocorticoid arrives with its binding protein in the blood to these cells, it will jump off. Because it's a fat, it can go straight through your membrane. Because remember, your cell membrane is a lipid. So it can go straight through that. And it can go to a receptor complex called a glucocorticoid receptor complex. Now it will bind to it, okay? When it binds to it, on that complex is usually two heat protein, heat shock proteins, that will move off and this is now activated. So this means that this complex can then go into the nucleus. Once it enters, enters the nucleus, it will bind to another receptor called a glucocorticoid response element. So that is now activated, which means it can work as a transcription factor on DNA. So what it will do with the DNA is it will look at certain genes that has something to do with inflammation. The genes that have, that normally make anti-inflammatory responses, it will make more of. So some genes that are, are anti-inflammatory, anti-inflame, it will make more of. And the other genes that make inflammation, such as these cytokines, it will downregulate, so it will make less of, okay? So I'll give you some examples. A protein that would make inflammation would be COX-2. So it won't make that much anymore. So it will stop making COX-2 enzymes. If you can't make COX-2 enzymes, you can't make prostaglandins, which then means you don't get your vasodilation as much. Same goes with phospholipase. It's again, this is an enzyme, it's a protein, which comes from uh, mRNA, which comes from DNA. You stop making it, therefore you stop doing that. Therefore you stop producing leukotrins. Therefore you get less vascular permeability and bronchoconstriction, which means it helps with that. These together, if you put it on the skin, so you put this on the skin, it will help with that effect that we went through. Glucocorticoids also help stabilize mast cells, stop them degranulating. So that's gonna help with the infl inflammation basis of skin conditions, whether it is a type one allergy, like we saw with pollen, or a type four allergy, which is contact-based, or a severe allergic reaction, Let's say you react to a drug or venom, your mouth swell up, your eyes swell up, your airways swell up. That can be used similar to the skin. The steroids can be useful to stop that manifesting. And then we can see that the use of cytokines will stop these guys happening. So therefore it would help the response in rheumatoid arthritis. So hopefully with that video, now you have an understanding of with the process of inflammation and the most common indications of chronic inflammation where you would warrant the need of an anti-inflammatory drug, how the glucocorticoids work then underpins how they're going to be successful in treating these conditions.